is there anything else we could put in place to help me keep on top of understanding where he where he's at? I, I don't I, I didn't understand why. <laughs> Sorry. Basically it's fine. <laughs> In this video, we're going to be talking about the OET speaking section. I'm going to go over some advice uh, and an explanation of how the exam is structured and how it is assessed. And at the end of the video, you're going to see an example of a real student, one of my students, performing this speaking exam. First of all, an overview of the structure. The speaking exam lasts for 20 minutes. This is broken down as follows. You have three minutes to warm up. During this time, uh, you and the, the patient, who is an actor, uh, will talk a little bit about you and your professional background. And then you will be given the role-playing card, we'll see an example of one of those in a moment, and you'll have three minutes to prepare, to read it, to think about what you're going to say during the consultation, and then the role-play will begin, and the role-play will last for five minutes. You'll then repeat this with another role-playing card. You'll once again have three minutes to prepare it, and then five minutes to carry out that consultation. So there are nine separate criteria that are used to assess your performance. The recording of your exam is taken and is sent away to the OET people and they review it and they mark it. So the patient, the actor, with whom you're having this conversation, they have no part at all in assessing you, so you can feel relaxed around that. Here's an example of a role-playing card. This one's um, about viral gastroenteritis. Uh, as it says here, you get two cards like this during the exam, as I've said. Uh, you'll get to keep the card with you uh, at all moments during the role play. So if you suddenly want to check back, that's totally acceptable and it will be within your ability to do so. Um, a final and very important thing that I should say while we're looking at this card is that you must, must limit your comments and your recommendations to what is said on the card. Don't start bringing in your own um, clinical opinion or your own experiences um, and don't give some very esoteric, unique recommendation. Just stick to what they're saying on the card. Um, remember as well, your clinical knowledge is not being tested during the OET. Only features of your spoken language in English are assessed. Your clinical knowledge is not important at all. You could be the best clinician or the worst clinician um, and it wouldn't affect your OET result at all. All about the English. So let's now go through the criteria that are used by the OET examiners to assess how well you have done in the exam. So there are nine criteria in total. Uh, we divide those nine criteria into two separate groups. The first group is um, the linguistic criteria, which we see here. This refers to elements of your spoken language, so intelligibility, how clearly are you pronouncing the words that you're using, um, how much of an accent do you have and to what extent is that interfering with your ability to communicate with the patient. Fluency, how quickly are you delivering the information that you have, uh, 
how many stops and starts are there along the way. Appropriateness of language. So are you using very technical uh, medical words, which a normal lay person would not understand? Or are you, ideally, hopefully you are doing this, um, using the kinds of phrases that regular people would use when having a conversation um, and not in a medical conference with colleagues, but um, a non-medical person having a conversation. So use that type of language. Know your audience, basically. Uh, and then resources of grammar and expression. This is referring to the types of structures that you're utilizing. Um, the types of grammatical forms that you use uh, and also about idioms. Are you using any idioms? Uh, then we have the five clinical communication criteria. So while the four linguistic criteria refer to the form of language and uh, your ability to speak uh, and express yourself well in a sophisticated and appropriate way in English, the clinical communication criteria is limit themselves more to questions of your ability to establish a relationship with the actor in the course of your consultation. So we've got relationship building, providing structure. Um, this is, you know, how organized are you when you lay out your comments? Uh, is it easy for the other person to follow? Um, are you being respectful at all times? Are you clearly listening to the person who's speaking? And are you using what they've said to guide your response? You can't just stand there or sit there, uh, whatever the case may be, and lecture the patient as though they were an audience of one person and you're delivering a script to them. No, it has to be a collaborative, um, res responsive conversation. So now we're going to go through each of those nine criteria uh, in a bit more detail, starting with these four purple linguistic criteria of intelligibility. So as the um, previous slide said, intelligibility is about how clearly you're speaking. It's about accent, it's about prosodic features. For example, the intonation, when you deliver a question at the end, it should go up, yes? Are you asking me a question? Right. Um, then we've got fluency. So to score all six points, and all of these are worth six points, all of the linguistic criteria are worth six points each. Um, to score all six on fluency, you shouldn't be hesitating or pausing, at least not in a way that suggests you're having problems with English. Um, not in a way that suggests you've forgotten the word that you wanted to use or you're thinking about how to conjugate that verb appropriately. Um, you can pause obviously in a natural way as though you're thinking, but not as though you're having problems with the language. Appropriateness of language. So we have um, a cartoon here. He says, or in layman's terms, I caramba. Okay. Um, so this is referring to your ability to speak in an accessible way so that anybody could understand you um, so that the most sophisticated uh, medical person could understand you and equally the least sophisticated non-medical person could also understand you so you need to speak in a way that's accessible to everybody because as a clinician you're going to be treating everybody, not just your esteemed, knowledgeable colleagues, obviously. Um, here's a little task. It says, could you explain osteoarthritis or myocardial infarction or sepsis in ways that anybody could understand? Um, avoiding these long Latin words 
uh, and instead using everyday phrases. Uh, I'll give you an example. If you're talking about maybe a degenerative disease uh, and you wanted to talk about the myelin sheath uh, on a neuron, you might describe that uh, as being like the insulation around a pipe. Okay, speaking with a simile uh, in order to make the information that you're giving more accessible in everyday terms for somebody without that um, clinical knowledge. The fourth and final linguistic criterion is resources of grammar and expression. This is about demonstrating to the examiner that you are able to use advanced grammatical structures uh, as well as idioms. So the idioms, we've got a few health related ones here. Uh, these are just some idioms I got from the internet. I don't recommend that you use all of them. Uh, for example, this one would probably be inappropriate if you said to the patient, Ah, oh, you seem to be at death's door. Don't think they would be very happy to hear that. Uh, however, this one is very appropriate and you could easily use it. You could say, Mr. Smith, we're going to do everything we can to get you back on your feet in no time at all. Please don't worry. Grammatical structures. We've got some examples here. Um, inversion at a negative adverbials. For example, under no circumstances. This is an example of a negative adverbial. Um, and after a negative or restrictive adverbial, we have inversion. It's not subject verb, but verb subject. So it would be under no circumstances should you take this medication outside of the prescribed limits that I have told you. Moving on then to the clinical communication criteria, of which there are five. The first one is relationship building. So as it says, you must begin each consultation appropriately. And that means a polite greeting, um, telling the patient who you are and what your role is in this consultation today, uh, explaining briefly what the consultation is, is going to be about and asking for their date of birth so that you can confirm that you're speaking to the person who you believe you're speaking to. Right? Um, important information to get at the beginning. Uh, also, of course, you need to be attentive and not distracted. Uh, you need to be respectful, not disrespectful. Um, be non-judgmental at all times and show empathy. Use some phrases which show that you relate to the difficulty they're having. Also, we've got our understanding and incorporating the patient's perspective. So this is about not delivering a speech, a lecture, but engaging in a cooperative exchange, listening to what the person's saying, using the information they give to guide what you say to them. So we've got some uh, phrases here that you could possibly use um, in order to show that you are engaging and listening to what the patient's saying. Um, a great technique which is asked for in the MARC scheme uh, is asking if you've understood correctly, right? Um, so after the patient's finished speaking, you try and summarize what they've said and asking if your summary is an accurate representation of what they've said. Um, so you can say, it sounds like you're saying that you've been having a lot of difficulties recently with chest pains and that you're very worried about that uh, and that you have a family history which is adding to that concern. Is that correct? And then that gives them the opportunity to see that you have um, listened to what they said. And also you can check if you really have understood everything because then they might contribute something else and say, well, yes. However, you've not said 
this thing, which is also important for you to understand what I've said. Okay, then we've got providing structure. That is delivering your remarks in a way that's coherent, that is um, guided and logical. And a way that you can do that is by utilizing phrases like the ones that we have here. Um, there's a little task that you could try and do if you just pause the video now um, and try and ask yourself of these phrases which one belongs in which category. So we've got introductory phrases, which of these are introductory? Connectors, which of these would you use um, in order to bring different comments together within the middle of your comments? And then finally, which are the phrases that we would use to conclude? Now let me go through the answers. This is a concluding one. All in all, I think um, this has been a very productive class and I'm glad you've learned a lot, talking of which, on a related point. Furthermore, last but not least, of course, that's a concluding begin. Uh, first of all, wrap up. This one confuses people a lot. It's a phrasal verb. To wrap up is to finish, to complete. So this is one that you'd use at the end of your remarks. You'd say, okay, well, to wrap up, I'm going to um, refer you for more tests and I recommend that you be cautious and uh, follow the symptoms that you're uh, experiencing and report back to me in four months or four weeks or whatever the case may be. More phrases here that you can use to signpost to clearly indicate to the person you're speaking with, where am I going next, right? Am I going um, to give a point that is closely connected to the one that I just gave? Am I about to give an example? Am I about to sort of take a step back and give a, a contrasting viewpoint from the one that I gave before? These are all great phrases that you can use in order to make the structure of your comments more intelligible to the listener. Uh, and then we've got information gathering. This is the fourth clinical communication criterion. Um, and it says, this section requires that you begin with open questions and then move later in the consultation to close questions uh, and that you avoid compound questions and leading questions. Okay, so you might be asking yourself, what is an open question, what is a closed question, what is a compound question, what is a leading question? Um, well, we've got here four questions, a uh, one closed question, one open question, one compound question, one leading question. Uh, a task for you, if you just pause the video, can you identify which is which here? Let me go through now. Um, the first one, Here's the task, it says, um, categorize the questions accordingly. So the first question is a leading question, right? It says, you don't ever miss doses of your medication, do you? So I'm assuming the answer. I'm using a tag question here, and I'm assuming the answer um, by using this tag question. So you shouldn't be using this type of structure. And the logic is, that you could cause the patient to give um, an answer that's not true because they don't want to contradict you. Um, so you say, you don't ever miss doses, do you? And they say, no. Uh, but the reality is yes. And maybe if you'd asked an open question, they would have told you. How are you feeling today? This is an open question. Um, it gives the listener a chance to say more than just yes or no. They can give you a free answer based on what they're thinking, what they're feeling. So these are the kinds of questions you want to begin the consultation with. Um, then we've got closed questions. As you move further into the consultation, you want to get concrete details um, based on your understanding already built up from the open questions. Now you start using closed questions. Uh, did you undergo surgery? Um, 
Then number four, it says, did you feel a sharp pain? Take the medication and then go to hospital. So you can see this here is a compound question. We've got multiple questions all put together. Um, and you definitely shouldn't use questions like this at any point during the consultation because, uh, and it's quite clear to see, you're not going to get accurate information because maybe um, I went to hospital and I took the medication, but I didn't feel a sharp pain. But if you ask this question, I'll just say yes, maybe. Um, but only half of it or only two thirds of it um, are true for me. Okay, So don't put multiple questions into one. Just be clear about what you're asking. Finally, information giving. Uh, this is about finding out what the patient already knows so that when you explain things to them, you're not repeating things that they already know or you're not assuming that they know things that they don't know. So first of all, find out what they know and then using what you know they know, you can give an answer that's tailored to their understanding as they've uh, explained it to you. Um, pause periodically as well when you're explaining things so that it's not just a long, long speech like a politician uh, in front of thousands of people. No, pause periodically so that you can allow the person uh, you're speaking with the opportunity to ask a question or to stop you and say, oh, I didn't understand that. Can you explain that again? Can you repeat that? Um, and check that the patient is understanding uh, and ask them how they're feeling. Uh, and at the end, find out if there's anything else you can do for them. Wow. Okay, so we've gone through the nine criteria by which you will be assessed in the OET speaking section. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about technique. Um, this is a useful technique or a useful way to think about the consultation. Um, it, remember, it's only five minutes, uh, and I recommend that you spend the first two minutes in what we've called here phase one, uh, and then spend the final three minutes in phase two. Of course, you can't sit there with a with a watch and, and measure this in a very um, accurate way, but it's just a guide, okay, so that you can feel a little bit more confident about how to approach this role play. So in phase one, I recommend that you start by introducing yourself, collecting the patient's details, like their date of birth uh, and why they're here today. Um, then show empathy with their situation, ask about any concerns that they have, uh, and then empathize again and summarize what they've said in your own words uh, and ask if you've understood correctly, right? Give them the opportunity to contradict you if you haven't understood or give them the opportunity to add extra information uh, and show that you have been listening. Then we move into phase two. So before beginning an explanation uh, in layman's terms, um, using idiomatic language and diverse grammatical structures and idioms, um, find out what they know so that you are uh, delivering your comments at a level which is appropriate and relevant for their current understanding. Um, and as you're explaining in layman's terms, using idiomatic language, using idioms, using grammatical structures that are diverse, regularly check to see that the patient is definitely following you, definitely understanding. Um, and relate the explanations to what you found out about them at the beginning of the consultation so that it's clear this is not a pre-prepared formulaic robotic speech but instead it is a conversation uh, and you're listening and what you say is dependent on what they say right it's a conversation it's two-way it's not a lecture uh, and then find out before finishing if there's anything else that you can do for the patient. Here we have some useful phrases that you can use uh, in different 
context during the consultation. Uh, I have a PDF with all these phrases that you can download. That's in the video description below. And now for the exciting part, we're going to watch one of my students do the speaking exam. Uh, and her speaking exam was based on these role playing cards, which you can see here. Uh, the first one is about a patient who has a herpes and you can download this um, speaking card that once again is in the video description and then the second of the two role plays uh, was about a two-year-old who's a fussy eater that is um, he's he doesn't like to eat lots of foods he just insists he just demands to have uh, the same sweets milky drinks over and over and over again uh, and the parent is concerned and therefore presenting to the doctor on behalf of their two-year-old so those are the two role-playing cards um, which will form the basis of the role play that you're about to see also if you'd like to read the comments that i gave this student um, if you'd like to see the assessment uh, and her grade that she got it was a very very high grade she did very well that also is in the description below okay good morning um i am dr ravira i'm your gp today uh can you please tell me your name and date of birth yes uh dr my name is richard Falk, and my date of birth is the 6th of january 1976. okay richard can you tell me please how can i help you today uh, yeah, I have had a just a normal cold for about five days with a runny nose and a bit of a sore throat. Um, but I'm here because this morning I woke up and I noticed a rash uh, on my on my chest near my ribs, um, which I've never had before. I don't know what it is. Um, it's getting itch, more itchy and more sore as the days progressed. And um, I just um, I don't I don't know what it is if it's connected to my cold or um, so yeah I'd like to understand what it is. I completely understand. I'm sorry you're going uh, through this uh, through this uh, situation. Uh, these uh, have you um, have you had a, uh, when you were a kid anyone anything similar to this? Um, I would have had chickenpox. Okay. Okay, um, okay. But that was more all over my body. This is just in a, one area. In one area. Um, okay. Uh, do you have any concern, especially about this rash that this rash that are, that are you presenting? Um, I'm anxious because I, I don't know what it is or what I should do about it. Um, and I'd like to know where it's come from. Okay, Richard. Well, um, this uh, this uh, this symptom and this situation that that, that uh, you're presenting has to be with this chickenpox you suffered you suffered in in your childhood. This is called the upper zoster. It's like an evolution of the chickenpox, but this can be related with the cold that you presented the day before. So your immune system may decay a, a little bit, and this uh, may like the, the the virus to be again um, like um, activated. So this is the presentation of an herpes zoster. This um, can be uh, not not a chronic disease or, or illness in your in your life to the future future, but um, can be presented when you have maybe some cold or something that may have your immune system to decay okay um we are going to this now do you have to, uh, uh, a question about this this uh, sickness illness yeah is there anything we can do to alleviate the itchiness and the pain of course there is a treatment uh, i'm going to send you uh what were creams for uh, to, uh, topic treatment for creams and also uh, i'm going to give you some uh, pain reliefs in the oral treatment also so um the idea is that you don't have pain uh, that the soaring is going to be better and also the pain on the skin that that is very very 
uncomfortable um, is going to be to, is going to make you better and also make that uh, that the sickness and the illness is going to contain. So it's going to get better in a less uh, time possible and make you feel better. In some days, OK, OK, OK. Uh, do, do, this, I, hmm? do I have to worry about it spreading over my body? Yes, you have to be careful also uh, because uh, these, um, this rash can be, uh, if, if you don't have a hand wash, a regular hand wash, if you, if you touch it, um, it can be spreadable, okay? But okay. the treatment that, that I'm going to send you, the idea is that contains the sickness and not make it spread on, on the rest of your body or, or and also with a great uh, hand washing, don't you uh, touch any, any other place in your in your body so yeah. you can spread it okay okay it is um this can happen and can happen to every every person that has chicken pox in the childhood we are all the spokes or, or spokes but uh isn't something that is going to be uh chronic or that is something that it, that is going to be something like uh permanent in your life, okay? This okay. can be managed, okay? Can Do you have another question that, that, that I can help you with? No, that's that's reassured me, thank you. Amazing, great job, Andrea. Let me send you the second role playing card. Okay. Andrea, you ready to begin? I think so. Fantastic, okay, five minutes starting now. Okay, good morning. Um, and Dr. Ravida, tell me how can I help you today? Uh, hi, Doctor. Um, basically, I brought my, as you can see, my son with me. He's two years old. Um, he's my only child. Um, in general, he's good uh, and no medical problems, but I'm really concerned about his appetite as I consider it to be very poor. Um, he never finishes his meals and he only drinks milk and sweet sugary drinks um and he just he's a very very fussy eater um and i'm just concerned about his weight and i'm i'm wanting to find out why he's eating so badly okay can you give me please uh, your son's name and date of birth yeah his name is thomas and his date of birth is the first of july 2018 Okay, so you told me that Thomas isn't eating like the same amount of, of food that he was eating before. Did I get it right? Um, in general, uh, it's more, I'm more, I've become more concerned more recently about his diet. Um, he's okay. become more fussy more recently. Okay, uh, does he eat everything that you offer to him? No, no, he's oh, very he's fussy. sticky in in some foods. Yeah. Okay. Um, does he does he eat uh, when you um, uh, I don't know, like fruits and vegetables, or there are some other meals that he prefers? Uh, he really doesn't like to. Um, the only things he seems to want to consume are uh, drinking plenty of milk and and sweet drinks what sweet uh, drinks um i'm afraid that's all the information i have um <laughs> but I basically i'm just can, could you have a look at him for me because i'm just worried that he's not growing properly because of this of course of course that that is that is understandable that you um feel this way also when when kids aren't uh, eating what we uh, know that is uh, healthy for them. Yeah. OK, um, Thomas seems to be uh, perfectly healthy. Uh, his weight is normal and the height that he has is perfect for his age. That, are, that is uh, two years old. OK, okay. Uh, this, um, this means that uh, he has the uh, great uh, growth chart he's on the on the point that he has to be um, meanwhile I I can recommend you that um, if he's drinking a lot of uh, sweet drinks for his health and also uh, for his weight 
management for being normal. Um, you can offer him another type of drinks, uh, like like uh, water that he can be uh, starting to be like more water and, and uh, rehydrate uh, himself and his body. Okay. Um, also, uh, about the amount of food, uh, this is important because when kids aren't in the rapid phase of grow of growing, their their meals intake can be decreased. So this is normal. The kids can eat. They, uh, they can eat less, and they are being equally great, um, uh, being good feeded for telling uh, in in a in a way. Okay. Um, the sugar intake is something that all parents can, can be worried about. Uh, the milk intake, it's okay. He's two years old. It's okay. He, he can uh, take milk, but uh, the sugar intake in candies or um, or uh, very sweetened drinks can be unhealthy for him for uh, in his growing and also in, in a future when he can be um affected in his health okay? okay but uh when he when he's going to be uh growing he's going to take more meals and more food and he's going to ask for more food because his body is asking to because he's burning more energy for growing uh, okay. okay okay uh do you have another question dc uh do you have another doubt about the information i just gave you um I, I understand what you're saying. I just, I guess I'm still just anxious about him in general. Um, is there anything else we could put in place to help me keep on top of understanding where he, where he's at? I, I, don't, I, I didn't understand why. <laughs> Sorry. Basically, it's fine. It's fine. Well, that's Andrew, the end yeah, of the yeah, yeah. anyway. That's fine. You can't oh. be more easy. Um, this is fine. <laughs> fantastic. fantastic. <laughs> All right, Andrea, thank you so much. Um, have thank a good you. weekend. And I'll write to you next week with feedback, OK? OK, thank you. Cheers, have Andrea. a great weekend. Bye. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this useful. Remember, subscribe for more medical English content. And if you would like personalised or group classes look in the description below there's a google form where you can put in all of your information and i'll be in touch about classes thank you very much and see you in the next video